God damn. Um, number one, start off on a bit of a somber note. Um, I guess R.I.P. and thoughts and prayers go out to Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain's family. Um, they back to back suicides. It kind of felt like I think they were separated maybe only by a couple of days. Um, Kate Spade, an inter- in influential fashion designer in Paris, Ciaro, socialite personality within the New York um, creative scene. And then obviously Anthony Bourdain, one of the leading voices in the culinary world, restaurant world, travel world, kind of the person that basically laid the framework or the blueprint for travel shows that you see today and how they kind of run, you know, the kind of solo traveler, the idea of going to different parts of the world and, and kind of um, put in uh, food or culinary delights that are necessarily given the limelight and giving them the platform that exposes it to a wider public, the idea of breaking bread with people in their natural habitat, um, the idea of embracing the rough edges. Um, both of them were influential people and yeah, man, it's been a fucking crazy week because obviously um, a couple, a few months ago, a friend of mine or someone that I've known for a while who used to be a security guard at quite a lot of clubs that I used to play for in Trinity Park of East London, of Dawson and Shoreditch, one of those kind of places. He supposedly, not supposedly, but he did take his life too. And that, took, and that hit me quite hard too because I remember speaking to him a lot about his depression after work and him feeling a bit down and stuff. And, you know, suddenly then he's gone. He's not around anymore. Um, but I was unable to get any more, glean any more information from the whole issue, issue because his family kind of kept it private. I'm assuming through maybe some weird sense of shame because, you know, a lot of African, black, Caribbean families have a weird, um, have a weird correlation with, kind of correlate suicide with something evil, you know? It's like, um, it's a sin against God. You're taking your own life, you know, because obviously every life is meant to be precious and stuff and you're made in the image of God. So taking your own life is kind of like you're spitting in God's face. So there's a weird uh, thing that, black people have with suicide in general so i'd assume that's the reason why they want to put any more information out or it could just be they went to keep it private and didn't want anyone else to get involved i can understand that too but i didn't really get that much information for about what aiden's death was and you know whether not to help out nothing really came out of there in that regard so that was a bit sad but it kind of made me did think it made, it made it made me reflect a lot on life in general and kind of the things that some people complain about it kind of made me prioritize some of the stuff that i'm thinking about um and also kind of maybe um it kind of reset my ambitions and my way that i kind of kind of going to conduct myself in life in general um i've kind of always had a bit of a practical way of looking at these kind of things but sometimes when it happens to someone very close to you it kind of kind of knock you back a bit and i guess in terms of kate spade it was sometimes something as well that was it did come out of the blue mostly because you know Anthony Bourdain at least had a history of drugs had maybe if you read in between lines of some of his recent interviews and a bit of his book he did kind of suffer from some forms of depression but most of it had to do because you know he was a by his own space by his own words he was a he was a complete failure until maybe his early early 40s right so he he kind of was trying to do the work but it never kind of worked out and everyone around him was succeeding and you know working in the restaurant industry working in any sort of service industry at that kind of age you, it does kind of fuck up with your head right it kind of makes you does think it kind of do think maybe i'm not as successful as i should be maybe I'm a bit of a failure i'm a disappointment to my family blah 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 so at least with anti Bourdain, there's a bit of a context there. Even though he was clean for most for most of his life, you know, since he came into the limelight and stuff, in terms of uh, hard drugs, he was still drinking stuff. But in terms of hard drugs that kind of really held him down, in terms of heroin and coke and stuff, he wasn't doing that as much as he was doing that. Um, he was doing it before. So, but at least with Anthony Bourdain, you can kind of uh, you can not understand, but you can there's there's more context to it, right? But with Kate Spade, it didn't. It came. It kind of came out of the blue because. I met Anthony Spade once when I went to Andy Spade, sorry, when I went to um, New York for the first time in 2009. Um, we went for our first kind of boys holiday, uh, me and a group of friends uh, who kind of were, were kind of prominent in the London uh, streetwear blogging kind of era. They used to run this site called BNTL, which I'm pretty sure is still around now. But in its original incarnation, it kind of, you know, highlighted all the sick, amazing stuff that was happening in London. Um, because I, that, it kind of came out after the the whole hypey stuff that was mostly LA and Hong Kong, LA, LA, New York and Hong Kong based, right? Mostly because it's based in Hong Kong, whatever, or like Japanese kind of centric. And BNTL did a good job of highlighting brands within London that were doing cool and interesting things. So we went over to New York in 2009, had an amazing trip. And during that time too, I also had my own blog called Stop Begging that was fairly well known within the scene. And I happened to connect with Heron Preston online. We became kind of like 
email pen pal guys whatever exchanging comments whatever i used to steal the theme of his website quite often which i'm sure he was aware of <laughs> um, and then i went over to new york and met him and then we were, we were we were eating and drinking in this place i think it's called like a screener or something some bar in new york right that's got like a it's sort of like a camper van i'm trying to get it up uh let me see if i can try to get it up la esquina is it la esquina la esquina new york Let's see if it's the one. That's why I remember bumping into um. Her, uh, I remember bumping into Andy Spade in this place. See if I can get up on the version. Yeah, here we go. Boom. So went to New York, had an amazing time, and met Heron Preston in this bar. Right, it's called La Esquina. It's a restaurant bar in New York. So as you see from the pictures, I'll, hopefully you can see it if, if you're watching it on YouTube. If not, you can, I'll I'll link everything on the show notes. But basically, it says bar in um in New York that serves like tacos and watermelon juice and shit really really nice but then it's amazing because once you go you can you go through the kitchen to get through this to get downstairs into this like secret bar that looks like that downstairs right really dimly lit like just an amazing bar downstairs that you come to go through a secret like a uh, kitchen door to go downstairs an amazing place right so i remember meeting andy spade um there and we actually were here at the, at the at the top so where um you kind of get your drinks and your tacos and then we went downstairs to this bit later on and he was such a cool guy man i remember reading quite a lot about him and uh, but i didn't know much about his wife at the time and i remember what well, i remember from that conversation of how highly he spoke about his wife and it might sound weird but i come from a family where most of the men in my family treat their wives like shit right um one of my uncles who recently passed actually um from a stroke he had a stroke in his sleep he had a he then it was discovered that he had like two different families in di two different continents right which was fucking bizarro and then the fucking funeral was an absolute shit show i heard it was like a world star thing people were kicking off and fights happening left right and center so i come from a family where uh, you know a wife is is kind of like a child bearing robot right you kind of go in impregnate them and then you go out and kind of live your uh bachelor lifestyle even and but then you're hiding each one right so I don't really have a I don't really have a problem with polyamory, but at least be upfront and let the person know that you know I'm in a relationship or I'm in an open relationship or I'm, I have the option to have other partners. But hiding people in general and being a shitty dad and a shitty husband is just something that I've been I've always been exposed to. So when I went to New York and I was speaking to Andy Spade and Heron, and at that time Heron had a girlfriend who he used to put on his on his blog all the time. At that time, um, obviously Andy Spade was married to Kate Spade, this influential designer, and they were both alphas because Andy Spade had his own thing too. Literally, literally he used to do books, insulation, part of just just a, an amazing power couple, right? Both operating on really high ends of the cultural and artistic uh, landscape. So then to come back and to hear this kind of really sad story that she unfortunately took her life is so, so, so gutting, man. Like, really, really gutting. And, you know, they've got a young kid as well. And, you know, there's rumors about maybe they had marital drifts and stuff, which I don't really care about. You know, someone's life um, was taken or they took their own life. And now someone's sister, mother, um, wife. It's not around anymore. It's just bummer, in it? And then with An Anthony Bourdain, which was, it hit me even harder because Anthony Bourdain is kind of the starting point for a lot of the people that I look up to in the podcast, comedy, um, entertainment industry, right? They kind of frame their whole way they look at things or the disappointment they have in their career or the things that they're aiming for based on what Anthony Bourdain was able to do with no reservations. Um, he came in, he, he came about in my life during a time where I wasn't very appreciative of food. I used to always say food for me was like a fuel source, right? It just I just make sure I keep myself alive. Just that's I just that's why I eat. But then I also, but then uh, to contradict myself, I had a very I had, I've got a very sweet, I've got sweet tooth and I love processed food, right? At the time, because that's why I, was, I used to be super fat. I used to be about two hundred sixty pounds, so I used to love eating fucking crisp and chocolate. But anything that to, anything pertaining to like actual real food, like pasta, rice, whatever it may be, I'd kind of like you know, turn my nose up at it, which is fucking ridiculous. But you know, stupid fat guy shit. So um, Andy Bourdain came around during that time where I was kind of a bit like eh, over food and he made me appreciate it in a whole different way because he was able to relate it to culture, right? He'd able to go to these different neighborhoods, different countries, different cities and sit down with people and actually break bread for real. Not in this weirdly manufactured, sterile way that um, other shows did where they, they really kind of went in and gave the whole place a lick of paint and kind of put in the right amount of lighting to make it look more fabulous than it was. He went in there and sat on those plastic stools like he did with Barack Obama in a dingy place somewhere, all right, and ate their food, drank their beer, you know, like didn't order anything off menu, ordered exactly what all the locals eat. And if anything, 
he was always known for all, asking whoever his fixer was, whoever the restaurateur was, whoever the host was, what they would eat, right? And have actually eaten that first, kind of getting appreciation of their food instead of eating the kind of the pacified Western version of what they eat that they kind of serve to tourists. And also he very, he ignited my travel bug, right? That was during a time where I hadn't gone anywhere, but I also knew that the life that I was living before of buying Supreme every week and uh, Double Taps and every other Japanese brand like Babe and all that stuff all the time and not making anything for myself or not exploring the world and becoming culturally aware and becoming worldly and having a, a, a philosophical standing or reading because he used to quote an, he used to quote an amazing amount of books and his little opening monologues of no reservations and, and the layover. It really opened my eyes to kind of getting diving deep in those kind of things. And it also, by a weird way, right, which is kind of going to sound crazy, but it also kind of led a lot, to, it kind of led to my mild depression that I had whilst I was living at home. I was living at home and I fucking hated it, right? Like me and my mum, especially my mum, we, we were having so many arguments. Um, it was during a time where I was kind of waking up to the idea that I had to leave the house. I was regretting the idea that I went to a university in London, in Central St. Martins, and I decided to stay at home and not go in campus because it was too expensive. And I just had a shitty time at university. It didn't feel like university because I was, I was in a, uni, a London university. Most of the people in my class were foreign. So there wasn't a real uh, way to kind of uh, speak to people or hang out. The people that were from London had their own friends. I so didn't want to hang out anyway. So we were left with no one really to chill with. I only made friends really in the second year. Um, and at home, I just didn't, I felt like I didn't have any independence, right? My parents are super conservative. They were always very, very um, hesitant to let me kind of live my own life or do my own thing. They were very, they kind of tried to molly on me, even though I was very independent from day dot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I probably didn't help the situation myself by being very combative in that situation. But watching a no reservation, seeing this guy who came from a uh, very bleak past, right? He had overcome drug addiction, had made be had made something of his life, met um, met a great girl who he had a kid with, uh, produced his own TV show, written an amazing book in uh, Kitchen Confidential. It really bummed me out, right? I felt like I should be doing that too because he here's somebody who made it, who made, who was a complete loser, basically, who, by his own words, um, before the age of 40 and kind of suddenly then became like one of the biggest um, cultural culinary stars out there. Um, obviously, most of it was due to his complete hard work and amazing talent, right? That voice is probably never going to be replicated again um, in food. But it kind of made it kind of shone a light on my life and made me think, wow, I'm not doing shit, right? Every time you watch this guy, he's in another far from place somewhere, play, somewhere, a place maybe you might not have even heard of, right? And he's eating amazing food and connecting with amazing people or just seeing amazing sights. Just amazing, 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 amazing. And I got really bummed out, really, really sad because... And this lends itself to the idea that Jordan Peterson says in uh, tw uh, 12 Rules for Life, right? There's one rule in there. No, sorry, in general, where he says, um, clean your first, clean your room first before you criticize the world, right? Get your own house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Now, it's, it sounds like a throwaway quote that you could find in, in any fucking Instagram page. But I guarantee you, if you live at home with very conservative parents or parents that think they know the best or parents that think they can't make mistakes or very just conservative parents in general or religious parents, right? Cleaning your room buying your own food right um even just painting my i remember when i painted my room white like fucking hell man it was weird like it, so it caused such a rift in my house i remember um get buying my own food was a lot of it was a big concern when i started doing keto diet and stuff whatever making my own salads and stuff my mom was criticizing that my dad was getting really angry about that and it kind of was in their in their point of view it looked like i was spitting at their feet right i wasn't i was taking the house for granted like i thought i was better than them in some regards so when jordan peterson says to people especially the millennials to you know get your own house in perfect order before you try and revolution before you try and go out there and do gum reform or change uh, the hierarchy or or strip down or or break down the patriarchy, whatever it may be, get your house done because that that strength of resolve, the battle that you have to go through in your own home, right, just to fucking buy your own food or to come or to come back when you please, right, is immense. And if if anything, it will toughen you up for the battles outside of outside of life. But if you've lived a life where you're generally always given what you want, and you suddenly step into the real world and you're met by challenges the first thing that will come to your brain is like, oh, I need to change everything, right? I need to fucking change the system, become an activist, which necessarily isn't really the way to, way, way to go about things. Fix yourself and then you fix the world. 
So I went through a bit of a slump with Jordan Peterson, but then, I mean, sorry, we through Anthony Bourdain actually watching the show and I stopped watching it. And then I started watching it again. And I started watching Layover. But then during that time, I also did a bit of self-work and I kind of got my own life in order and aligned myself in the, in the right way. And one of the things that kind of helped me do that was to write a list down the things I wanted to achieve for myself, right? Not based on what Anthony Bourdain was doing, but on my own, on my own, um, on my own back. And I've got a list here that I found. If you're not if you're not watching this on YouTube, then um, I'm I'm going to describe it to you. I just read this is a list I found from 2011, right? From dif- November, no, from now to uh, probably I'm assuming for October September, right? I made like a list of my goals that I wanted to achieve that uh, by the end of the year, 2011, and this is what kind of mended my depression or mo- I, it wasn't even depression. I was just bummed out, right? Um, and that wasn't necessarily where I thought I was going to be. Um, weirdly enough. It's weird because I was always told from when I was younger that I was going to be, I was, I was destined for greatness, right? I was special, right? Everyone that met me thought, oh my God, you should be doing that. You should, I've always been, people always suggest fucking careers for me, right? Oh, you should be a presenter. You should be a YouTube feeder. Everyone's always, everyone's got suggestions about me, right? And I'm sure they don't, they probably haven't got their own shit figured out. It's fucking annoying, right? So it's sort of like when you decide you want to start uh, working out or do a new diet, everyone's got a fucking opinion, right? So everyone kind of saw, I, Everyone's probably, again, not to be disparaging, I think everyone was found it easy to identify something in me, which I probably didn't see in myself, right? So, but with that comes this um, weird sense of disappointment, right? Of failure when you haven't necessarily reached those lofty heights that everyone else is saying that you should have. And internally, you also think quite highly of yourself, right? So I had this weird uh, delusion of grandeur and a very humble nature where I know I'm fucking the shit, but I also know I, I'm not shit, right? It's this weird sort of like balance I maintain within myself. Most of it is an inner dialogue. I don't necessarily say this out loud apart from this lovely podcast. Thank you for listening. So, but the way I dealt with it was to manage it, was to make a list of things and break it down, right? And this list from 2011, I'm going to hold up to the camera now. Uh, I'll describe the list so you guys can see it. Hopefully it kind of shows up. It basically says what I wanted to do. Number one, Complete insanity. Number two, drop weight to 200 pounds. Number three, jog more. Number four, eat more healthy. Number five, sleep better. Number six, finish transcribing Love Fever interview. Number seven, take pictures of the betting shop for the betting shop project. And number eight, do more, speak less. That list, right, what kind of rejigged my whole insides, made me recalibrate everything and put me down the path that was that was going to eventually lead to me being where I am now, right? I'm a, I don't know, good functioning human. I contribute to society. You know, good house. Got brunette here, chilling, nice group of friends, doing my own thing on the side. But that was able to. I was. I stopped having FOMO. I stopped looking at others and uh, uh, kind of judging my success base, judging my success based on their successes, or thinking I'm a failure because I'm not necessarily where they should be. Right. But imagine, the, imagine the stupidity of it. Right. Me at 19, 18, living in my parents' house, comparing my life to a 40 year old. Even if he was a teenage star, right? He has a track record of, he has a, a rap sheet, a CV of experiences, right? I don't have shit, right? I think at 19, I, must, I might have had two jobs, if that, right, in my lifetime. And I'm comparing myself to a 40-year-old. But it does happen because you're watching TV. It's accessible. Anthony Bourdain is a very um, personable person, right? He's very down-to-earth. He's super funny. He's kind of like the every guy. He's like the uncle that everyone wished they had. Or, you know what I mean? Like, so you can... It's easy for your brain to just decide, oh my God, like he does, he's a human, he does that. Why can't I do that? And that's not necessarily how things go about, but that's what, that's why I can understand what can easily lead you down a depression wormhole. But that really helped me making this list really, really helped me because it kind of, it kind of allowed me to kind of get centered and figure out, no, 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 no. You have a lot to do yourself in your own career, right? In your own thing. You have so much to do right now for yourself. The last thing you need to be worrying about is what bloody uh, Anthony Bourdain is doing, right? That's the last thing you need to do. And also along the way of doing anything on this, on this list, the process is more important than actually ticking off the, the points, because if I end up, com- even if I end up not completing this insanity, right, that beach body workout, the fact that I went through it allows me to, uh, to know where I am, right, in terms of uh, physical capacity. And it also maybe gives me an idea of what I can do next, right? So nothing is a failure. Um, even if I don't drop my weight to 200 and I get it to 210, I've done 210. That's amazing. Even if I don't jog as much as I should jog, I've jogged already. So it's given me a bit of a taste for it and, and showed me that maybe it's not as hard as I think it has. I, I think it will be. Everything has a positive to it, and the process is what the positive is, not the end goal. And that's what eventually leads 
to curing, in my opinion, my my own depression because I had something to aim for. I had a target to go for. I wasn't sitting there like bummed out about my own life and looking at someone else's success and thinking, fuck, I should have that. But I also know that depression for most people, it's not as simple as 